you also mentioned that your your dad told you another way of doing it. Instead of hitting it with the RF, you just spin the sample around. Yes, uh, I got, we had a interesting uh, revelation in one of our earlier calls about another idea my dad had, which I just mentioned out of the blue. He thought that you could have an aluminum uh, wheel or disc or flywheel, and you would spin it, and this would orient uh, orient the electrons. And then Mark told me that this, this blue area inside of this diagram was a spinning disc. And I don't know what the, is it aluminum or? Yeah, it's a spinning disc. It's an aluminum flywheel in the center of an electromagnet. So this is. It's exactly what Chad said. Super coincidence out of nowhere. Uh, and I did not know about this. Well, I, I'd seen pictures of the vehicle, but I'd not seen the parts labeled. So this was uh, news to me. My dad took one look at this diagram and said the green area that you're looking at there is a capacitor and it's to uh, create uh, the uh, pulse microwaves in the shell of the craft. Now this is the vehicle that apparently that the Air Force had reverse engineered from the 47 Roswell crash and it was flying in 1954 but it wasn't flying very well. And I think that the Air Force interest in my dad's theory might have been uh, in order to get a theoretic, a theory that would match the technology that they had been able to reverse engineer from the alien craft. And that's what they got, but they didn't get it until 1981. Now, after the 1981 paper, um, I have it from a uh, apocryphal source, uh, somebody who I met at a UFO convention. I don't know his identity. He had a name badge that was flipped over. And uh, he said, oh, are you David Alzafon? And I said, uh, well, yeah, and you're related to Frederick Alzafon. I said, I'm his son. He said, oh, say, um, did you know that the, you remember 1981, the paper that he wrote back then? And of course I knew, I knew that, he knew that. There's the paper. And uh, he said, yeah, the CIA, did you know that the CIA hired 17 mathematicians to go over that paper and check every equation and all of your dad's equations were correct and then as that was sinking in he said um yeah there's the vehicle he said would work uh i don't think he wanted to draw a saucer but uh that's I another form saw, i saw on facebook a picture of this craft actually flying they actually built one like this oh god yes there's another one i didn't know Yes. Uh, that, that, uh, well, anyway, I don't know exactly where that drawing came from, but it was 1981, and I think that uh, my dad drew it with uh, drafting tools, but he, I don't think he copied it from anywhere, or he would have told me about it. Uh, or maybe okay. they actually went and built it because that's what was in the paper. Well, that could be too. <laughs> well, it, Maybe your dad designed it and, and they built it without even telling him. It well, definitely would work. <laughs> I, I'll have to send you the link to that picture. It was posted on one of the UFO um, chats on Facebook. Yeah, yeah. So somebody read that paper and, and then made up a hoax to go along with it. Oh, it could be. <laughs> So <laughs> your dad's story sounds so much similar to uh, the, bi the the Thomas Townsend Brown story. Is this is different? And I want to distinguish that this technology, the Biefeld Brown effect, is the, the gravitational effect. It's, it's 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 actually a thrust, and that's what I think is actually going on over here. I think your dad was wrong about the parallel plate capacitors in the base. I think his experiment is actually going on in the center, because they weren't using any RF for this. Otherwise, they would have cooked the uh, occupants. What they're doing here is they're using that to negate the inertial mass oh. as best as possible. And the parallel plates capacitors in the base are being pulsed in order to create the thrust necessary to now move this craft that is now, you know, 99.9%, you, know, uh, you know, destroyed. You know, that, that, it's, that it only weighs 0.1% of, of its original weight. Yeah, because that blue, that, that, sorry, that blue shielding area would be a lot larger. If that were the case, if, if that whole green area were producing, you know, it, it, it would, it, that group, that blue area would have to be a lot larger. So I think you're yes, right. Yes, but, but there is a, um, this effect actually does spread to surrounding materials. As yes, I'd like to interject a word here about that. The nuclear orientation is contagious. 
So if you have a central core that's flashing the hull with microwaves, it doesn't have to reach the whole body of the craft equally because the effect itself will bleed out from the center and eventually reach every corner of the craft. So um, yeah, I can't point to parts of it, but let's say you had a waveguide in the center of that object that you're holding up before the screen and you were flashing the microwave signal around the interior cooking the pilot and so co-pilot. But let's just say there, this is a drone, so you can do that. Then the, you would be creating dynamic nuclear orientation in the, uh, in the top of the craft, but it would eventually bleed out to the entire craft. And then you would have a weightless vehicle. So basically this is the source of the nuclear orientation and it sort of creates a nuclear orientation magnet that goes out and orients the entire craft as much as possible. You're not gonna achieve 100% here, but that's why we have the parallel plates in the base. They're being pulsed in order to create, you know, the couple pounds of thrust that it then takes to control the craft. And there's a little ball over here that controls which parallel plates got pulsed. And the tanks, that's for the hydrogen fuel cells that power this whole thing. And this Wonderful. was the control arm to get samples from Mars and whatever. Yeah. Uh, it's, that's great. Now, the way this thing flew, as I heard it, was that it, it tended to hop like a grasshopper. Uh, do you have any ideas about why it might have done that? Um, probably because when it was close to the ground, it uh, weighed so much that it needed to pulse all of them in order to, uh, to get off the ground. That's probably, that's probably why. But this was built in 1956, uh -huh. and I think it's a crime against humanity that we're still driving around in... Uh, gasoline guzzling uh, cars. Yeah, now let me just mention that the price of an anti-gravity vehicle would eventually come down out of the stratosphere to about the price of an SUV because there are very few moving parts. It's all electronic. It's like a, an extension of the Silicon Valley revolution into space and into aviation, civil aviation. Uh, a vehicle is going to be cheap. Yeah. And um, that's, I mean, it's gonna also take over uh, airplanes as well. Oh, oh yeah. There, there is one issue that I wanted to bring up and that is if you're gonna have microwave radiation being emitted by these craft, it's not something that you're going to land in your backyard. You're going to need space ports that are probably gonna be like Faraday cages that you go into and there's, you know, you have a, a Faraday cage in order to get into the craft and then it takes off. It's not going to be something that you have in your garage and you're flying around, you know, here in New Jersey like that. Well, um, um, electric cars are still going to be a thing. I think we should ask the aliens about that because they've been uh, observed to be hovering over uh, people and neighborhoods. Now, sometimes you do see microwave uh, discharge that is harmful to the people who are observing the UFO. And... Uh, so, but in other cases, you don't, and I'm not sure exactly why, but you know, I think that spinning desk- It sounds to me like losses or leakage in a system. You know, like the, the idea behind this, like as you mentioned, you, you said it starts as a wave in this one spot and then it, it vibrates out locally from that, that area. That, that, that screams coherent states at me and that coherent states of matter. And um, if there's damping, too much damping in the material, too much damping in these effects, then you're not going to get those coherent states to spread out from that one spot and spread over the whole surface of the craft. And, and that goes back to, again, what you said about why they're shaped like saucers or bells. Why is a bell shaped like a bell? Oh, it's it, it, because that was the most resonant shape that they could think of, that they could create an object that wanted, they wanted, they created a bell in the bell shape of a bell for resonance, you know? Why is a saucer, why is these flying saucers also in the shape of a bell? Because of resonance. Because when you have this type of resonance, you have this lossless effect, this lossless transmission of those waves. Again, the propagation where there's, there's less dampening um, and there's less of those effects uh, that, that, that cause the losses. And that, that's again, when, when I'm thinking microwave radiation that's leaking away from my craft and is causing danger to my surrounding environment, I'm thinking that you're having too much loss in, in whatever your, your, your propulsion system is, that you're not, you're not, you know, you just need to be more efficient. Um, um, yeah, I definitely agree with that. 
there's a, there's a, another little uh, anecdote I want to interject about flying saucers. And that was always a big mystery. How do they stay up in the air and why are they shaped like a saucer? And this was used to ridicule the idea that there was any reality to the phenomenon. It didn't conform to our ideas of aerodynamics. But now uh, we can see that it's a perfect design aerodynamically. Uh, my, the way my dad described it was one day I went into his uh, office and up in Oregon and, and he said, take that book off the shelf and take a look at page 726. And I opened it up and there was a diagram on that page of a perfect radar antenna, which was shaped basically like a bowl. And he said, does it look familiar? I said, no. Well, it's a radar antenna. I used to see those at Stanford. And uh, he said, well, looks like half of a flying saucer, doesn't it? And uh, suddenly it hit me. What you have with a flying saucer is a bowl facing a bowl, and both of them are ideal radar antennas. And this minimizes the amount of energy that you have to put out to get dynamic nuclear orientation in the hull of the craft. So it's the perfect design. Two bowls facing each other, two radar antennae uh, facing each other. And um, well, anyway, that was my, that's why we see the saucer shape used over and over again. It's efficient. 